Hi, this is Roger Moore, and you're listening to James Bond Radio. Hello, my name is Jack Lugo, and you are listening to James Bond Radio. Our guest today is Van Jensen, who is the writer of the upcoming Dynamite Comics Ian Fleming adaptation of Live and Let Die. Van also wrote the Casino Royale adaptation, which was released last year. It was great to sit down and talk to him about the process that went into adapting these two Ian Fleming novels. Van also talks about some of the creative choices he had to make in order to tell these Fleming stories within the comics medium. Um, He also... uh, um, describes the interactions he had with Ian Fleming publications and some of the resulting creative decisions uh, that stem from those conversations. And um, hey, I always find that stuff really interesting and fascinating. So um, it's it's great to see how all of this came together. Um, the Live and Let Die uh, adaptation from Dynamite Comics will be released um, in this, on December 17th of this year. So uh, that'll be right in time for the holiday season. If you haven't already picked up uh, uh, Casino Royale. It is available right now. You should definitely go and do yourself a favor and pick that up. Uh, it's uh, an incredible retelling of the E.M. Fleming novel. Uh, it, it brings a whole new perspective to uh, the way you experience that story. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, a similar uh, experience reading Live and Let Die when that comes out later. Uh, so um, you can pick up um, these uh, E.M. Fleming adaptations, um, Casino Royale right now and uh, Live and Let Die uh, later this year on on December 17th, wherever comic books are sold. Uh, So without further ado, here is my talk with Van Jensen. My name's Bond. James Bond. Bond. James. Bond, what do you think you're doing? The British end up, sir. Welcome to James Bond Radio. News, reviews, and discussion. All things 007. As you can see, I have no problem with female authority. Oh, pipe down 007. Do you expect me to talk? No, who is the bot? I expect you to die. Hi, you're listening to James Bond Radio. I'm Jack Lugo. I am here with the writer Van Jansen, uh, who wrote the comic book adaptation of Casino Royale, and is uh, and Dynamite is also releasing uh, his adaptation of Live and Let Die um, later this year and dis- on December 17th. Uh, welcome to the show, Van. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, thank you for coming. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I was a huge fan of Casino Royale. Um, I actually spoke to Dennis Calero about uh, his work on it. Uh, but I, I've been, you know, uh, very uh, eager to talk to you. Um, so um, let's dive into a couple of um, um, quickfire questions. Uh, so this way the audience gets a sense of like where your Bond fandom is. Uh, so um, what is your favorite Bond film? It's it's obviously such a you know a kind of tough thing to quantify because there's sort of different eras of my life of watching and loving Bond films. So you know, I I grew up and my cousin and I uh, when we were pretty young started to work through all the Bond films. So this would have been like right around the time I think that Goldeneye was coming out, um, or maybe even a little before that that we started to to go through them. And I, I really, I loved, uh, I loved the more take on the character. You know, I, I, I loved, uh, like, I don't know, just, it, they were so like, I always think about Octopussy, which is a very, you know, silly, uh, absurd one, but it was just so much fun and, and so big. And I, um, I grew up in this really rural part of Nebraska. So it was like, you know, cool to see stuff that was just very, very different from everything that I grew up in. Oh, well, you'll be happy to know for about $6,000, you can buy a replica of the backgammon set used uh, during the scene. <laughs> <laughs> they, Is that all? <laughs> yeah, yeah, only $6,000. Uh, and you can reenact that, that that scene, which is my favorite scene, by the way. It's actually my, maybe my favorite moment for Roger Moore as Bond, you know, when he, uh, during that backgammon scene where he, he doesn't even look at the dice and, you know, he gets a double six and he knows he has a double six and, he, you know, he has the confidence and the you know the the swall you know he, he just executes that perfectly uh so, yeah <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> 
Um, so um, who is your favorite Bond actor? I, I, I mean, so again, it's like different, different things change. So I, I really like Lazenby. You know, it's a very different Bond, obviously, um, and not something that kind of fits in the canon as much. But and especially as I've come to work in film, I just I really um, I'm more and more as the years go on, appreciate what he was doing as a performer. Oh, yeah. Um, we're all big fans of George here. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Honor Majesties, I think, is probably uh, – it's uh, it's uh, it's probably in my top three uh, Bond films. It's just, you know, and he just gives such a remarkable performance that is now being more appreciated. I think over the years he, he was unfairly kind of judged. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I remember for so many years I would tell people that I liked that movie and they would just stare at me like, <laughs> you know, like I was a crazy person. It's like, no, go back and watch it. It's great. Yeah, they, they actually had um, a 50th anniversary celebration of that movie at Peace Gloria, um, which yeah, I wish I could have gone to. But, uh, you know, some of the footage and photos from that uh, he actually you know returned there and they had uh they they had an event there where they they um our uh, james bond tribute band played uh the music from the film the, the from the score uh they looked pretty amazing oh wow that's great <laughs> so um let's talk a little bit about how uh you first got involved with this um dynamite uh fleming adaptation series uh was this something that you kind of lobbied to get because i know if i'm a, a huge bond fan and i i have this association with dynamite i i would be like begging them like emailing whoever the editor was for for like every, every day to to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i mean yeah so i i I was a, you know, have been for, for ages, a huge Bond fan. And so, um, yeah, so the gig, like when, when it first, I think it was first announced that they were doing Bond and, and I didn't know entirely, like it, it hadn't really been released exactly, um, you know, what all Dynamite was doing with Bond. It was, it was still a little bit amorphous. So, but it was right before New York Comic Con and I've, I've known that crew for a while. So I was at New York Comic Con. So of course I went and talked to Nick Brucci from Dynamite and, you know, it was really, I was just like, Hey man, like I, I know you have a million people gunning for this, but, um, just, you know, wanted to tell you I'm a, I'm a big fan of Bond. So, you know, if you're looking for someone to do some Bond stuff, uh, give, <laughs> give me a shout, you know, it was like me, me and everyone else on, on earth vying for the job. And, um, and so then as time went on, they, they had me pitch for the original, um, scripted series like the new series yeah. that of course warren ellis ended up doing and you know so they they reached back out to me and they're like well you know i'm I'm sorry like we we have warren ellis doing this series and i was like you know i i can't complain about getting beaten out for a job by warren ellis <laughs> yeah yeah he did a great job uh that, that that's yeah that, he did two of them i believe um right yeah, they're, they're both very good yeah so so then at that point um they they told me we're doing these adaptations and you seem like you'd be great for that and and I had I had not come to bond through the novels you know I, I was relatively late in reading the novels but by the time that you know I was in I think college I had started reading the novels and I I think I had read some of them when I was younger you know it's hard to remember exactly when I read different things, but, but I, I, you know, I had by that point some real familiarity with the novels. So when they asked me about that, I was like, yeah, you know, actually those novels are really good. They're, you know, there's some amazing stuff in there. So absolutely, you know, I, I am down for that. So then it was just this kind of beginning process of getting me introduced to the Flemings and figuring out the, you know, the way that we were going to approach this because it's those novels are not something that just readily translate to comics. Like it took, it took some real work to figure out how to turn them into comics. 
Yeah, I was going to ask, like, how do you arrive at what Casino Royale and Live Let Fly should look like conceptually, like, without, you know, by, and, you know perver- preserving Fleming's prose, but, but with, obviously you're, you're on a visual medium, so I could imagine that's very challenging. Yeah, and the, I, the truth of it is that Casino Royale was a colossal challenge because it is, and you know, you're familiar with it, so you know this. It is not a visual book. Like it's a very internal book. It's a ton of what's going on inside Bond's thoughts. Yeah, a lot of moralizing too. Like he he questions a lot that more than you would you would expect. Yeah, exactly. It's it's him, and I mean, I I think it's Fleming to some degree, kind of like working out who this character is and what you know, what he'll evolve into. But he is he is very much not that sort of fully formed James Bond at that point. So so yeah, so it really was me sitting down with the novel, and and I just went with my copy of the novel uh, that I had on on hand and started to just i reread it once and then i reread it again but very purposefully marked it up as i went and i was really just like carving it into visual sections of sort of like well i feel like this makes sense as a section and this makes sense and this is you know this is where i would break it apart and so that was the first you know what the script was originally is just and i i still have this copy of the of casino royale that's it's just got pen you know marked across every page all all over everywhere with that's great all these like super unintelligible notes and like little (laughs) sketches that i made to myself to try to like parse you know how how could possibly work you should include that as like part maybe like the end you know after you know um at the end of the novel you know the book just to just to see some of those I, that, those would probably be very fascinating to us yeah i should um i'll i'll reach out to dynamite and see if they <laughs> you know have have any uh space to add some of that stuff in um but yeah you know so so there was that and then and then i basically took that document and prepped a really big explanation document that went to the Flemings that was just like, Hey, this is who I am. This is my thought process. This is how I want to approach this thing. This is why I want to approach it this way. These are the things that I want to change. You know, what's your comfort level with these changes? Um, because I didn't, you know, the last thing I wanted to do is, is like, come in and take this very sacred thing that they of course are very reverential of. And so many people have a ton of reverence for and, and treat it, um, you know, cheaply or casually. Yeah. So, so once I did that, I think the Fleming saw, you know, okay, this, this guy is really putting the effort in, putting the time in, you know, he's thinking through all this stuff. This is, you know, I, I had to convince them that they were in, you know, good hands, okay, essentially. That was going to be my next question. Like, how involved are they in the creative process? Is there a lot of back and forth? Oh, a ton. Okay. Yeah, they're they're hyper involved. I mean, especially especially on Casino, because there was, you know, they don't they didn't know me at that point. We had no, you know, no working relationship. So I'm just, you know, some random guy. And so they want to make sure very understandably that I'm not coming in and messing up, (laughs) you know, (laughs) not not just messing up James Bond, but messing up the, the novels, like the, you know, the, the ur text of, of this whole thing. So, so yeah. So, and then once we got working together and once I got scripting, I mean, it was everything from, um, you know, me asking, like, I have to trim down some of the exposition, like, there's just not enough room for all this text. So like, can I cut this? Or can I cut this? Like, we have to make a choice. So there are those kinds of conversations. But then there were also conversations that they would, you know, they would give me notes. And it was like, this is the exact type of bathrobe he needs to be wearing. Okay. It's like, all right, <laughs> I will. I will make sure that it is that exact right uh, bathrobe. Yeah, no, I think you did it in a very clever way. Like the texts are like the different sections of text are you know this you know are kind of distinctive for different 
ways that you would read it. So, um, and I, I kind of like the little touch of like, you know, this is like the sixth cigarette of the day or whatever number it was, you know, it, I, I thought it was, it was very, very cleverly done. Well, thank you. Yeah. So that was a thing. I mean, we kind of came around to calling that, you know, quote unquote bond vision. Okay. Because, you know, one of the things that happens in the novel is bond will come into some new setting and what it, what happens with the narration is that it's like Bond analyzing the setting for threats and then like thinking through all of like he's always thinking stuff through and analyzing details and all all of that stuff, which is all not visual. And so immediately I was like, how do we take that stuff that is not visual and make it more visual so that because, you know, it's yeah. no no one has any fun reading a comic book that's just piles and piles and piles of text yeah no it's it's like i said it's very it's visual but i think you found the right balance um so talk to me about the challenges of adapting what is considered to be ian fleming's most problematic novel uh live and let die um do you, is it possible to sort of highlight the merits of the novel the story of the novel without some of the like unfortunate attitudes uh that are that appear in fleming's novel Oh, and, you know, it. I have always been very upfront about, like, and, and talking to, to the Flemings of, I mean, it was the same thing with Casino Royale, is, like, unambiguously, there is some really ugly stuff in here. With Casino Royale, it's sexism and misogyny, and with Live and Let, Let Die, there's sexism and misogyny to a slightly lesser degree, but then also a ton of racism, and... So, you know, with Casino Royale, we had a note at the start of the book that it, that contextualizes some of that within, you know, this is the time that this was written. This is who Ian Fleming was. This is his background. This is sort of, you know, it, it doesn't excuse it, but it just says this is the world that this guy was writing in. Um, however, with both Casino Royale and Live and Let Die, there were specifically things that I found that were very problematic that are also, I think, you know, not – there are things that can be cut out of the story without diminishing the story in any way. And so with both books, I reached out to the Flemings very early on, and I the way that I put it to them was – you know, hey, there are some things that are in here that I I can't write. Like I'm I'm not comfortable with it. I don't, you know, it's just like I, I'm not gonna have a book come out with my name on it that has this kind of stuff in there. And so here are the reasons why I think that we can cut this stuff from this book without it hurting the book. And if you're, you know, if, if you're good with that, then, then good. And if not, it's fine. Just find someone else to do this book. Okay. Yeah. Cause I know with the film adaptation, obviously there are some po problematic things about that, but uh, the one thing that they did improve upon was they, they got rid of the use of the slang, which I think uh, sort of diminished the character, the, the, the black characters in the novel. Um, and they made the, the black villain characters uh distinctive they weren't um you know i, I feel like they they you know to a lesser they, obviously there are there were some issues that uh can certainly be, be brought up with it but i thought at least for that time um it it wasn't as bad as it could have been and it's a it's a movie yeah. that i still enjoy um so how, yeah. did, how did you approach that like the use of like the slang and obviously the n-word appears a, a few times um so uh how how is that dealt with uh in your adaptation yeah, so I I had no comfort level with using the N word, so I told them like that was one of those things. It was like that, you know. I my suggestion is to cut it entirely. If you guys want to leave it, that's fine. But you know, again, find find someone else to write it. Um, and they said, no, no, we're you know we agree. Um, and then I mean there there's that, and then the you know there's even. Um, there's one chapter that's Bond and Felix Leiter going into Harlem and it's, it, it's not even subtle. It's this very overt and it's, you know, 
it's worth saying that it's Felix Leiter is the sort of one who is um, pushing this and who is saying the most racist stuff within the scene, which I that's think, what I found too. Yeah, when I read and, the novel, and my assumption is that that's Ian Fleming commenting on racism in America, but it doesn't it doesn't read subtle enough to you know like it's it's not something I think that's like worth salvaging as as a sort of point um but they you know they go to harlem and it's the way that it's written is like they're going to the zoo yeah uh, a lot of references that are sort of you would not want to use today uh uh are made um but it's you know i i think um it, the story of live and let die itself is is, is one that i think is is, is uh, i enjoy i mean i also enjoy the film uh so it's 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 sort of i can imagine the challenge that you were facing um having to adapt it um does your adaptation sort of dive into mr big's um history uh because in the book he's like he was an agent who defected and he has this whole kind of backstory i thought that might be like an interesting thing to to see once uh in your book if 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 you sort of dive into that yeah absolutely so all of that is all of mr big's backstory is there within the book and yeah i mean that's that's one of the things that comes across very strong within the novel is mr big is this you know terrifying figure and he's terrifying because he's smart and and that's a really important point throughout the book. And when I say important, it's important in that Ian Fleming emphasizes that point right. very, very uh, repetitively is that, you know, Mr. Mr. Big is a criminal genius, even kind of above and beyond anyone else that that Bond has has faced off against to this point. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think as as much as it's still like, yes, absolutely. It's, it's still, um, is a book that I would describe as having the racist attitudes of the era. I, I do think that Fleming's views are a lot more subtle than, you know, just like you, you can't look at Fleming and just say, Oh, that guy's a racist and like write him off. Right. Exactly. Uh, I think it's, it's sort of like, uh, there's a degree of nuance that you kind of have to bring to, to the, to the discussion, and, uh, you know, some people are more open to it than others, but it, you know, it is a, it's a great story. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a nice novel to sort of go back and reread even, you know, after you've read it again, it's, 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 it's a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to your book. Bond does happen to eat a lot in this film, in this book though. Um, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to ask you, was that a challenge for you? Cause I can imagine if I was sitting there trying to adapt this novel, uh, um, um, you know, and I see, wait a minute, here's another meal that I have to break from the action for. <laughs> How <do> yeah, you... <laughs> I, I, I think I might have cut one or two of them, but that, that's also like very interestingly, like the the Ian Fleming estate, like they want that detail in there. They're like, this is a very important part of it is the specificity of the meal. So, oh yeah. Uh, oh okay. Got and, it. Yeah, you know, some and, of some of them are based on real places. Like I actually sent you. Uh, I don't know if you got the um the the the, the place glorified ham and eggs was a real place. Uh, and their motto. Right, uh, right. Right. Yeah, the motto in the book is "The eggs we serve tomorrow are still in their hens," and, and I thought that was just a great thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's. I mean, it it is fun, and I I do think it says a lot about the character. But yeah, there there are definitely. I mean, it's there's nothing like live and let die is a big fun. You know, when you think about the tropes of Bond, right? Big, larger than life villains, like gadgets, action set pieces, all of that stuff. Like live and let die has that stuff, whereas Casino Royale does not have that stuff really at all. It's so. There's I mean, it has, it has sort of like, yeah, so, so Live and Let Die was on the whole just way, way easier to write. I mean, Casino Royale has, uh, it has an entire chapter that's Bond laying in a hospital bed. And, you know, that, that's the kind of thing where I come to it to write an adaptation. I'm just like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? I, I have no <laughs> idea. What, to, what do I do with this? Uh, so, so yeah, Live and Let Die, yeah, there, there were choices to make, but it it was 
exponentially easier. Okay. Uh, so what do you want readers to take away from your live, live and let die adaptation? Uh, do you, do you want them to sort of remember the action and the violence or, or is there a, a, a stronger message um, in this book? Um, you know, I, I do think that live and let die is like, it is just a fun book, but I think it, it, <sighs> Casino Royale is kind of Bond coming into his own, and I think Live and Let Die is Bond really grappling head-on with the cost of what he does and the high likelihood that he's going to die. And and there's a real a real heaviness of of kind of mortality and strength in the face of mortality to it. That's, that's the thing that sticks with me. I mean, I, I'm also a big believer that every reader interprets things their own way. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking for, like I said, it's, 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 I mean, I want it underneath my tree one uh, for, for Christmas this year. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. Um, Do you want to tell me a little bit about your other graphic novel that's being released called uh, two dead? Um, what appeals uh, might it have to Bond fans or fans of the thriller noir genre? Yeah, so uh, Two Dead is coming out in November from Gallery 13, which is a uh, Simon & Schuster imprint. And it's a story that's set in Little Rock, Arkansas. And it's um, – so it, I guess there's sort of a southeastern uh, connection with it and Live and Let Die – but it's um it's set in the mid 1940s and it's a it's based on a true story that was something that I actually uncovered when I was a reporter at the Arkansas Democrat Gazette and it was this weird time where uh Little Rock and Arkansas had a ton of organized crime and the city was strictly segregated and amidst all of that the chief of detectives of the police department was schizophrenic and thought that demons were overtaking the city. And so it it was a really, I mean, really bizarre thing that had kind of been historically hidden um, because of what all that, that happened. Um, And so I, you know, I came across it and it had been just one of those things was like, this is one of those like truth is stranger than fiction type of things that stuck with me and stuck with me. And and then I teamed up with Nate Powell, uh, who won the National Book Award. He's the first comic book artist to win a National Book Award for the March series, the John Lewis autobiography comics. Um, and it's just, it's a really, you know, sort of big, uh, ballsy noir story um, but it's also more than anything, it's it's about cycles of violence and, and how they just perpetuate through societies. Oh, wow. That, that sounds fascinating. I'm going to look I'm going to look for that as well. Um, are you currently working on a Moonraker adaptation? I am not. Um, I hate to say, but Live and Let Die is going to be my last adaptation. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> no, it's. You know, I just I've, I'm working on a lot of different stuff between comic books and and film and TV. And so as much as I love doing the Bond books, it was just a point where I was ready to to move on. You know, they're they're a lot of fun, but then they're also um, they're they're a ton of work on kind of on the, the back end. Like it really it takes it takes a lot of effort to get these books out into the world and, you know, working with the artist to make sure that everything's accurate. And so, yeah, as, as much as I, I wish I could, you know, do them and do them forever. Uh, two, two is great. And okay. I, I count myself fortunate to have, you know, spent that long in, in Bond's world. Okay. Well, before I let you go, um, I, we're all anticipating uh, the, the, uh, April 2020 release of um, of No Time to Die. Um, is there anything you want to see from that film? Well, I so I just was reading about how uh, the the writer, um, gosh, I'm blanking her name, Phoebe Phoebe Wallerbridge, Phoebe Wallerbridge uh, contributed to the writing of it. So I have to say, my interest in it went from sort of you know general interest to 
I'm now I'm now very interested to see what happens. And I guess the thing, you know, the thing that I'm going to kind of watch is knowing that this is Craig's last film. You know, are they going to do something novel in transitioning the franchise forward? Are they just going to, you know, kind of hit some sort of stop and restart point or, you know, are they, are they going to do something bold and like, uh, introduce a new, a new bond, uh, or something along those lines. So there's, there's always the, like, just try to enjoy the movie, but then, uh, you know, all of, all of the stuff around the movie. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, you know, like I said, lots of bond to look forward to. Um, thank you for joining us, man. And, um, we're all going to be looking for, uh, the, your adaptation of live and let die, uh, for around Christmas time this year. And, um, you know, we're sorry to see that, that you're not coming back, but you know, like I said, we, we, I, I think you did a brilliant job with Casino Royale and I'm, I'm looking forward to live and let die. So thank you for, for, you know, working on this because I think Bond fans want to see these the, these stories told, and you know, it's it's done in a way that it, it sort of creates a, a, a sort of a new way to approach the story because obviously the films are their own kind of different thing. Uh, whereas I think your comics, it, it's a, it's really you know they're really telling the Fleming story uh, in a way that really you know hasn't been told aside from like the comic strip uh from the 50s um you know hasn't been told visually um until now um as, you know with the comic strip aside so thank you for 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 you know that work that you've done on these two books oh absolutely you know it's again it's it's just been i don't know i mean i i grew up on a farm in nebraska and i can say <laughs> that i've gotten to write James Bond comics, you know, how, <laughs> how can I have any complaints about that? Thank you for listening to James Bond Radio, the comics of Bond. And thank you to my guest, Van Jansen, for taking the time to uh, come on the podcast with me. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, the December 17th release of Live and Let Die. Uh, definitely uh, look for that wherever comic books are sold. And uh, until next time, I've been Jack Lugo, and you've been listening to James Bond Radio. Bye! <laughs> Hope you enjoyed the show. Good night.